get me. From Studio A in Arcata, behind the Redwood Curtain, it's time for... Suckatash. Yes, Suckatash, the comedy soundcast, soundcast featuring snippets from comedy... Soundcasts. And also interviews with comedians, comedian soundcasters, and other showbiz folk. And now, here's this episode's host from up the coast, the man who puts the X in Xbox and the tie on antisocial... Comedy Soundcast Soundcaster, Tyson Saner. Saner. Insaner. Insaner. Thank you, Bill Haywatt. Saluto and estos me, Tyson Saner, and I welcome you heartily to this 351st episode of Succotash, the Comedy Soundcast Soundcast, which just so happens to be the last episode of Succotash before our 12-year special which will then be swiftly followed by a well-deserved hiatus. If you are a first-time listener, this show features clips from other soundcasts from around the world and has for almost 12 years. The entire archive of episodes past can be found over at www.succotashshow.com for the time being. So if you end up enjoying this program and you'd like to share it with others, send them there, or pretty much anywhere else you can listen to soundcasts, which are also called podcasts most everywhere else other than here on Succotash. Last week in episode 350, show creator and executive producer Mark Pershon brought you a Chats episode that featured conversation with and fascinating stories from Shane Elliott of the sketch comedy group from North Hollywood called Fries on the Side that Mr. Hershon had also been involved with. It's a fascinating and funny chat that you should check out at your earliest convenience. In this, the last episode I'm producing before our aforementioned hiatus, I have brought you some clips to listen to from the soundcasts Holidays After Dark, What Went Wrong, and Bit Weird, but fair enough, I guess. I'll be rounding out the show with two clips from StrangeTimeShow.com, who just celebrated ten of their own years in soundcasting. The episode clip for this purpose is number 462, titled Ten Bloody Years. Many soundcasters sent in their congratulations in audio form, so I've decided to include the one I sent and the one Mr. Hershon sent. Those will be played at various points in this program. I'm even throwing in a classic Henderson's Pants ad into this episode just for kicks. It's one of the oldest ones, I think, if the numerical system it came with is to be believed. Well, the show isn't going to finish writing or producing itself, so let's get into it. See you on the other side. And between things, too. First up, Holidays After Dark. From Holidays After Dark, its show description says, Holidays After Dark is a year-round podcast which explores the strange, unusual, and dark sides of the holidays while also paying tribute to the light-hearted festivities we all know and love. The clip is from the show from March 28, 2023, called Easter 2023, Tale of a Homicidal Hare. Its description says, In this episode, Holidays After Dark explains the history behind how the Easter Bunny came to be, and tries to determine if the story of the bunny man killer is real or simply an urban legend. Clip I've selected is from somewhere in the middle. Enjoy! According to the History Channel, the Easter Bunny made its way to America when it was first introduced in the 1700s by German immigrants in Pennsylvania. They reportedly brought with them their tradition of an egg-laying hare named Osterhasse from the old country. As the legend goes, the rabbit would lay colorful eggs and give gifts to children who were good. So, kids would make nests in which the bunny could leave his eggs. Similar to leaving cookies out for Santa, the children would also sometimes set out carrots in case the Easter bunny got hungry while making his deliveries. This tradition gained in popularity and made its way across the country until it was a widespread Easter tradition. Over time, the fabled bunny's delivery expanded from just eggs to include other treats such as chocolate and toys. Since rabbits are mammals and, therefore, give birth to live young, it might seem odd that the Easter bunny goes around passing out eggs on this holiday. It turns out the reason for this is likely a combination of two fertility icons. First, the fruitful reproducing rabbit, then the eggs as a symbol of fertility, rebirth, and new life. Combined, the two strongly represent the springtime themes associated with Easter. In modern times, the Easter bunny is usually depicted as a white rabbit with long ears, often wearing colorful clothes similar to the ones humans wear. 
He can often be spotted at Easter parades in malls, waiting to get his picture taken with eagerly awaiting and sometimes terrified children, and at other celebratory events this time of year. The bunny often carries with him a basket filled with colorful eggs, chocolate, candy, and other treats to hand out to the kids. Despite his widespread popularity, it's not always a rabbit who brings Easter eggs to children in some parts of the world. In Australia, the Easter bilby comes around on the holiday. The bilby is an endangered rabbit-like marsupial, which is native to the land down under. Other gift-bringing animals include the Easter cuckoo in Switzerland, and in some parts of Germany, the Easter fox or rooster. How cute would it be if all these animals traveled the world together, teaming up to deliver eggs to children on Easter? While the Easter bunny usually brings along with him feelings of nostalgia, joy, and childlike wonder, in one part of the United States, a decades-old urban legend took that classic imagery and turned it upside down into something much more sinister. Let's investigate the tale of the Bunny Man. So you can follow Holidays After Dark on Twitter at Holidays Podcast, which is all lowercase H-O-L-I-D-A-Y-S-P-O-D-C-A-S-T. And you can follow them on Instagram under the same handle. You can also follow host Kristen Searing at underscore K-R-I-S-T-I-N and then two underscores, the numeral one and the numeral three. Now that is host Kristen Searing. They also have a Facebook page. And in their description at the end, they're giving a special thanks to Night Owl Productions for producing and editing the episode. I would like to point out that Night Owl Productions apparently also produces films, videos, and photography, according to their website, and is uh, Ashley Searing. Their website is nightowlvideo.com. That is N-I-G-H-T-O-W-L-V-I-D-E-O dot com and holidaysafterdark.com for Holidays After Dark. And that is H-O-L-I-D-A-Y-S A-F-T-E-R-D-A-R-K dot com. And now, here are the folks over at strangetimeshow.com listening to Mark Hershon's contribution to their 10-year anniversary episode. Remind me to uh, mention our new merchandise store after this next bit of audio um, by the podfather himself, Mark Hershon. Hey, it's Mark Hershon the originator, co-host, and executive producer for Succotash, the comedy soundcast, soundcast. I want to be sure to wish the Strange Times podcast a happy 10th anniversary, but things are extremely busy here. At Succotash Patch Productions, we're in the middle of constructing a brand new headquarters, as you can hear in the background, and things are kind of nuts. So instead of me taking the time out to do it, I've turned it over to the chat GPT AI writing program, and also the natural reader reading program to actually put together this tribute for the guys over at Strange Times Podcast. Hit me. Ten years ago, the world was introduced to the Strange Times Podcast, hosted by Davian Dent, Kat Sorens, and Dom Risk. Since then, they have consistently delivered smart, clever, and slightly deranged content to their listeners. The trio's unique brand of humor is both infantile and sophisticated, making for an entertaining and exciting listen. Their discussions on a wide range of topics are always informative, but never boring. Their British wit adds a certain charm to the show, and the host's dynamic chemistry is undeniable. Over the years, Strange Times has covered everything from current events to pop culture, and their takes on these subjects are always fresh and dangerous. The hosts are not afraid to take risks and tackle controversial topics, which sets the show apart from others in the industry. Fans of the show have come to appreciate the hosts' dedication to their craft, as they continue to produce high-quality content despite the challenges of producing a podcast during a pandemic. The Strange Times podcast has become a staple for many listeners, and the hosts really? have built a loyal fan base over the past decade. In conclusion, the Strange Times podcast has been a joy to listen to for the past 10 years, and we look forward to many more years of smart, clever, and slightly deranged content from Davian Dent. 
Pat Sorens, and Dom Risk. Happy anniversary, lads. Blimey, I feel like I've listened to a dissertation on the show now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank what you very I much, wanted? Mark. Indeedy, indeedy, indeedy. Yes, indeed. Um, Suckatash, the comedy soundcast, soundcast. Yes, you still insist on calling podcast soundcasts. Um, yeah, thank you very much for all the help you've given us over the years, all the lovely exposure. Next up, What Went Wrong from Sad Boom Media. Its show description says, What Went Wrong covers Hollywood's most notoriously disastrous movie productions, digging into behind-the-scenes insanity of everything from massive flops to record-breaking blockbusters. Uh, so... I really love a movie podcast, and this could be my new favorite one. Now, I've chosen a clip from the episode from April 3rd, 2023, and I've already gone back through the archive and started listening to the beginning of it because I really enjoy the amount of work that went into the information gathered in this. Uh, It's for the movie Gone with the Wind, and I learned many things that I would have never... I probably wouldn't have otherwise uh, come across uh, like I had. So, the description goes on to say, Vivian Lee. Clark Gable and Hattie McDaniel may star in 1939's Gone with the Wind, but this was David O. Selznick's Dumpster Fire. Join Chris and Lizzie as they break down a truly disastrous production featuring 15-plus writers, 3-plus directors, an amphetamine-fueled producer, and racism galore, both on screen and off. Yikes. A little bit about Margaret Mitchell. She was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, around the turn of the century. She was highly educated. She was a debutante. She went to Smith College. Um... Her grandfather was a Confederate soldier. Uh, He also made money selling lumber for reconstruction. As you can tell, Margaret pulled quite a bit from her own family's history um, for Gone with the Wind. She is also of Irish descent. She was raised Catholic, but I think one of her parents was also Protestant. Um, And yes, her family did own slaves. Uh, Her mother also died while she was away at school from the 1918 flu pandemic. And Interestingly, Margaret's own grandmother, who apparently was just a total bitch, uh, was her kind of primary source for Mm. information because she was around. She was around for the Civil War and Reconstruction. Didn't like her, but um, she did. She told her a lot. She also spent time as a child with a lot of Confederate veterans. So the picture you're getting here is like... (laughs) This is yeah, not someone that's who's That's where the fan fiction comes yes, from. Yes, exactly. It's, that's yeah. that's where I think people are giving this maybe a little bit too much credit when they try to say that like no, like it's it's calling out the south for for being stupid, for being it, it's really not. I like I no. I hate to break it to you. Um, this is this espouses all the views yeah. that were held by the south. Well, and interestingly, this is one detail that really kind of put pulled it into focus for me. She did not know that the South had lost until she was 10 years old. And she found out, I saw a bunch of different versions of this, but the the general story is that her mother took her on a tour of all the plantations that Sherman had burned um, mm-hmm. on his march to the sea. And she talked about the world that those people had lived in and how it had just like exploded and been ripped out from underneath them. And then her mother is like, someday that's going to happen to you and you better have a weapon. It's like, whoa. <laughs> it just goes to show you how little actually changed. And there was not any reflection that was really being done, especially at a national no. level. And the creation of the Jim Crow South was just an extension of what had come before. Uh, unlike Germany following World War II, where when it became clear that they were right. forgetting the past, they made a concerted effort to not forget and double down on Holocaust education. We did the opposite, clearly, as a country. We very much did. We and made I, Gone with the Wind yes, instead. Yes, exactly. I think this movie is is a total product of that. Mm-hmm. She was a journalist. She was writing for the Atlanta Journal. I saw some places that she liked to collect erotica uh, and was reading a lot of it while writing Gone with the Wind, which also tracks. Um, and then she was recovering from an ankle injury and her husband was like, you're annoying me so much. Can you please write something instead of making me go back and forth to the library a million times? And so she wrote Gone with the Wind. Uh, yeah. It was, again, an immediate bestseller. It won her the Pulitzer Prize in 1937, if you can believe that. I mean, listen, it's it's an entertaining book, but it's like a beach read. So the book's a big hit. Producer David O. Selznick bought the rights the film rights, a month after it was published for $50,000. MGM and Fox both declined. 
Selznick also originally declined um, because he didn't want a Civil War picture. That's what everybody said. They were like, those don't perform. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't care. We don't want it. But his story editor, Kay Brown, who had brought it to him originally, pushed back. And she was like, I really think you're wrong. I think mm -hmm. this is a massive, massive hit. And I don't think you can let this go. She was right. So he went ahead and he bought it. Now, David O. Selznick, he was one of the biggest producers of the time. He'd worked at RKO, MGM, Paramount. And in 1935, he'd formed his own company, Selznick International Pictures, with distribution running through United Artists. Remember that. Yep. He has a very fascinating backstory that we don't have time to get into, unfortunately. But basically, his father was a very early pioneer in silent filmmaking who ended up losing it all, while his contemporaries like Louis B. Mayer rose to the top. Didn't Selznick marry Louis B. Mayer's daughter? Yes, he did. We're getting to that right now. Oh, yeah, that was like he, the one uh, Selznick fact I knew. Yep. He also added an O to his name to differentiate himself from his father. Uh, who nobody liked, especially <laughs> Louis B. Mayer. And he also wanted to sound more like Louis B. Mayer or right, Cecil course. B. DeMille. Um, but he still managed to become a major player in the industry and, as Chris said, married Louis B. Mayer's daughter, much to Louis B. Mayer's chagrin. He did not right. like him. <laughs> and didn't he, and he leased out the old Culver Studios, yes. I believe. Because yeah. I thought that was what was under the title of Selznick it International is. Pictures, right? Yeah, and that's in Culver City, California. You guys can go see the the exact view from that photo from the street. So I managed to find the show on Twitter. What went wrong is under Went Pod. That is all lowercase W E N T P O D. Lizzie Bassett can be found on Twitter at Lizzie C Bassett. That is capital L I Z Z I E capital C capital B A S S E T T. And uh, Christopher Winterbauer is actually kind of hard to find information about, not on Twitter, uh, but he is on Instagram as the Winter Farmer, and that is all lowercase T-H-E-W-I-N-T-E-R-F-A-R-M-E-R. -E -E but I guess if you really want to know more and also help the podcast out, you can go to their Patreon, which is at patreon.com forward slash what went wrong podcast, W-H-A-T-W-E-N-T-W-R-O-N-G P-O-D-C-A-S-T. This portion of Succotash is brought to you by Henderson's Turtleneck Slacks. If you're a gentleman of proportion who tends to leave nothing to the imagination whenever you squat down, or if you've ever been mistaken for a bike rack just by bending over to tie your shoe, maybe it's time to consider checking out a pair of Henderson's Turtleneck Slacks. Where most pants end at the waistline, Henderson's Turtleneck Slacks are just getting started. You get a generous three inches of ribbed cotton fabric that both gives and supports where it counts, the gut and buttocks. What's more, there's no need to worry about whether your belt matches your shoes. With Henderson's turtleneck slacks, you just pull them up and forget them. The ingenious turtleneck waist keeps your pants in place, and even if you have to jump around... We guarantee you'll never show anything so much as an inch of butt crack or a sliver of that ample full moon. It's always tucked away safe and sound in your Henderson's turtleneck slacks. Originally designed for plumbers, construction workers, and priests, you can now pick up a pair of Henderson's turtleneck slacks wherever fine pantaloons are sold. And now back to Succotash. Thank you, Bill Haywatt, and happy birthday here in early April of 2022. And now, here is my contribution to the strangetimeshow.com 10-year anniversary episode number 462 and the reaction it received. Let's have another little bit of tribute audio, shall we? Um, let's, I, I tell you what, random number generator. Uh, Dom, pick a number between 1 and 50. Cucumber. Uh, okay. Seven. Seven. Okay, we'll play number 13 by Tyson Sainer from Succotash. Hello there. This is Tyson Sainer from Succotash, the comedy soundcast, soundcast, anti-social show, Nooner podcast, Tumblr, and Tyson Sainer Gamer, wishing the happiest of 10-year anniversaries to... Yeah, mate, yeah, thank you. Get on with the tribute. It's uh, it's not all about you, darling, all right? <laughs> Strangetimeshow.com. So, yeah... One can only really have a 10-year anniversary or something once, as far as I know. So, really, I hope it's just really, really happy. 
I tend to say really more often than I should, really, but take comfort in the fact that A, I say it far less often than I think it, and B, that makes me really unhappy. But what does make me happy is to know I've been alive and listening to podcasts in the best era of podcasts, which has, of course, been since about 2007 to right now, which, as I record this, is a little over 16 years. Ten of those years have been filled with some form of strangetimeshow.com, and unless I'm totally wrong, the show being listed as strangetimeshow.com is a somewhat recent development. Ten more years. Ten more years. Ten more years. Wow, that's really difficult to do when you're trying to be quiet in a room by yourself. Reading from a script you just wrote. Running out of ideas. Well, anyway, sending my love and heartfelt congratulations. As a fellow podcaster, I can say that a decade of doing whatever the fuck this is, is nothing to sneeze at. It is really something else. Or, it's just this. It's just exactly this. Don't be strangers. Or timers. Or showers, for that matter. Peace, love, and tofu. Um, me. What? <laughs> 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 so, blimey. That was very deep and meaningful. Oh, very, uh, very Zen Tyson. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time to produce such a beautifully spoken and well-produced piece of audio for us. You are worthy of laudation. Um, mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Tyson. Someone give him the class and that was wonderful. <laughs> oh, sorry, Don, mate. It wasn't my proudest one. It wasn't my proudest one, I'll be honest, but I enjoyed yeah. that immensely. <laughs> <laughs> Blimey, well, you've, you've got another 11 wanks left. It sounded like, do you know what it sounded like to me? It sounded like one of those um, documentaries or public safety films that you used to see. Yeah. And they were like, uh, nitrogen in your world and how it affects you. We use nitrogen every day. But not as quite as... (laughs) Children, don't put your penis in a fireplace. (laughs) No, but the American versions... It, the, the American ones where it's like uh, some chemical company's done it, like uh, how cobalt affects your life and why it's that important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like that. I'm I like those right? <laughs> Finally, bit weird, but fair enough, I guess. From The Angry Chimp. Long-time Succotash listeners should be familiar with The Angry Chimp by now, but in case you aren't, the description says of this soundcast, Stuart Buckland and guests look at some of the weird stuff going on in this crazy, crazy world. It's very short and to the point. clip I have chosen is from way back on the 1st of February, 2021, entitled God or Demon? Question mark. In which the description reads, British lady in South Korea, Samantha Pett, joins Stu to examine weirdness surrounding cats, exams, Toast and processed meat. Yes, it's Samantha Pett, formerly a co host of StrangetimeShow.com for a not insubstantial amount of episodes, and a podcaster in her own right, with programs such as The Kimchi Chronicles and Anarchy Audio, I believe. Keeping with the theme of including StrangetimeShow.com content in this episode, and also wanting to feature Mr. Buckland, relatively recently established Soundcast, I was pleased to be able to get both of them in one episode. So here's a clip. So that was an entree, I think. You you have one or two other things yes. to chat about. I I do, and I'm really happy that you, on your uh, book of faces today, you shared a picture of your kitty cats. Uh, I did, yes. They um, We've got two stools here. I've got two cats, and they just kind of have taken to sitting on the stools for the majority of the day. Uh, occasionally reaching across to slap each other because they tend to <laughs> enjoy fighting, but um, uh, it's very low key fighting, very low energy fighting. It will be just a, so a, get, slap, oh, a slap, you. slap or two, and then go to sleep for an hour, kind of deal. Okay. Well, yeah. I wonder how would they have survived during the period of the Battle of. Pelosium in 525 BC. This Pelosium. is like Pelosium. That sounds, that sounds Roman as well, is it? It's actually Egyptian and Egyptian Persian. Pelosium. Okay. Mm. This is a, a, just like like a weird story, but it's 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 actually true. Mm. Um, so Egyptians, surprisingly, I didn't know this. Um, I just think of like, I don't know, again, I'm being, am I being racist again? I don't know. I just assumed like in the old times, people ripped meat off bone with their teeth and 
chuck the bones behind them or something. Yeah. But Egyptians didn't. They were actually mostly vegetarian or pescatarian. Okay. Um, and by design, I wonder? No, by choice. By choice. Okay. Animals were kind of worshipped by them. Yeah, yeah. And then the fall of the Egyptian empire came about because um, so it's the Battle of Pelusium and the Egyptian leader was, I can't I have trouble saying his name, Pharaoh Semetek III. Right. And he was up against the Persian king of Cambyses II. Okay. The Persians should have lost. By all accounts, Persians should have lost. But By weighted what, numbers, you mean? Yeah. Right. But the Persian king was very smart. And I'm sure, like, everybody knows cats were, like, revered by Egyptians. Or oh, you're going to tell me but, some sort of tactic that where that they, um, you know, used cats in some way. To t- yes, I am. Wow. <laughs> yes, I they am. They didn't throw cats at the Egyptians. They didn't put them in a catapult or anything, did they? Uh, that's where the word catapult came from. No, I just made that up. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's not true. Did you, did you hear the, this, the tension in that silence there? I was ready to go with that. I wish I could have held it. Oh. Um, so, wow. yeah, cats. If you'd if you'd said nothing, that just would have been. You would have uh, believed me. Oh wow! <laughs> okay, we can just it out and pretend that it's real. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so what what happened with the cats? Why why were cats so important? Was I was curious, like why why cats? And they were associated with the goddess uh, Bastet. And Bastet, the goddess, was often depicted as being like half cat, half woman, or mm. like a mix of both. And if you harmed a cat, it was like offending the god, the goddess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they took it, they were really serious, they were really serious about it. If you killed a cat, you were put to death. Okay. Um, if a building was on fire, the responsibility was to rescue the cats before putting the fire out. Right. And if <laughs> you had a pet cat, like we yeah. both of us do, if our cats died, we would have to shave off our eyebrows to show our grief. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh. so this comes back to the Persian king who had learned this about the Egyptians. And so when he went into battle against the pharaoh, he had uh, live cats being carried into battle Hmm. And he had uh, his army paint images of cats on their shields and a couple of other um, S- sacred animals. Because so they would even want to... Har- yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. Sorry, I'll yeah, stop to it. Even right. harm, <laughs> to even harm the image of a cat right. was to offend the goddess. Brilliant. So the Egyptians would not throw spears or arrows okay. at the oncoming army. So what they try and do? Trip them over or something? It's about yeah, that's all about what they could do. That's pretty much all they had left. Yeah, really? or they had to come like really close to hand in hand combat, and then still they could not hit <sighs> the shield. Just have to do that kind of slap them on top of the head, Benny Hill style, really fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Was... But however, I have I have a different theory. Oh yeah. So while this is historically true, I think the actual truth is that cats were demons. They were associated with demons, not gods. And how I know this is because I am going to play you a recording of my cat. And this is what (laughs) proves history was wrong. History was wrong. Cats were associated with demons. Okay. okay. Let's see if I can get this to work. Mm, a little scared. Oh. <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> That's terrifying. Yep. You have 
You haven't adjusted the pitch of that or anything? <laughs> no, that is exactly how it is. Wow. Well, not to try and wreck the story or anything, that just might, that sounds to me like a cat with a hemorrhoid. <laughs> that is my cat every freaking day. Oh wow! Well. I mean, that could have, that could have just been the whole story. You, my cat sounds like this. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> the end. Yeah. So have we uh, have we attempted an exorcism of any kind on this animal? No, he's too vicious for that. <laughs> okay. Do you just kind of stand next to its bed and say the power of Christ compels you? At, 30 times? No, he's a beast from hell. So this is why I think that historians have got it wrong about... <laughs> I don't think the Egyptians, like, yeah. worship them. I think they yeah. were in fear. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for that. That um, was both uh, enlightening and frightening. <laughs> you so. good. <laughs> so you can find the Soundcast on Twitter at weirdfair. That is capital W-E-I-R-D, capital F-A-I-R. The guest, Samantha Pet, can be found at SammyJ89, all lowercase S-A-M-M-I-J, the numeral 8 and the numeral 9. Host Stuart Buckland can be found at Buckland Stew, that is capital B-U-C-K-L-A-N-D, capital S-T-U. And since it says here, the follow the bit weird socials, I've decided to include their Instagram as well, which is... Uh, <laughs> B-W underscore B-U-T underscore F-E. And those are all lowercase. And there it went. My last episode of Succotash before our hiatus. What an amazing ride this has been. It's really hard to wrap my head around the passage of time, it seems. I don't mean to say that I don't know what it is, although I don't know what it is, more than someone who studies that sort of thing might, or might claim to. That, that's what people who study that sort of thing say, right? I know what time is, in casual conversation. Or perhaps sitting by themselves in the middle of a cafe, working through what they imagine a conversation of that nature would be like, ultimately culminating in an unscheduled outside voice moment. No, I don't mean to say that I don't know what it is, although I don't. It, it happens. I witness it, it continues to happen, and I attempt to fill it with variety and relative happiness. And music. I can't forget the music. Coming up next, and also last, for, uh, well, let's just say I'm not specifically sure how long it will be before we reemerge with something, but my understanding is that that is the plan. There's one of those that-that's again. Is that a peculiarity of the English language? I suppose I could look it up, but I'm not going to do that right now. I'm going to be working on other things in the meantime, and you will be able to find those things over at www.tysonsainter.com, as well as an archive full of stuff that I've already done as of this recording. Music, gaming videos, a Redbubble store, stuff like that. And who knows what else? I'm not 100% sure, but if I needed to be, I would never create anything. And there will be plenty of time for an activity, um, let's just say, later. Before I go, I need to remember to say thank you to Mark Hershon and Joe Paulino for making me feel like a valuable contributor to something for the last 10 years of my life. It's a very specific thing to say thank you for, I know, but it's a very specific sort of gratitude I feel to those who would include me in their creative endeavors. I do not, and hopefully never will, take that sort of thing lightly. But now, I have to make the awkward transition into actually saying goodbye. So I will end by saying thank you to my parents and my wife for being supportive of me in many ways, including keeping me alive for the entirety of this experience I call life so far. I hope I didn't make it more difficult than it had to be. Hashtag goals. Thank you for listening. Be decent to each other. And when you are out there in the world, should you seek out or perhaps stumble across our archive during our absence, and you got something out of it that can only be expressed by sharing it with others in some form or another, for example, sending them to www.succotashshow.com, then we will experience gratitude for you, for having done so. It's what we dream about happening when we utter the final words of every episode, which are, please, pass the succotash. You've been listening to Suckatash, the comedy soundcast, soundcast, with your host, 
Tyson Saner. Brought to you by Henderson's Pants and... Imagine your company's name right here. Rate us and review us at Apple and Google Podcasts. Find us on the web at SuckatashShow.com. On Stitcher. On iHeartRadio. On YouTube. On SoundCloud. And wherever fine soundcasts are streamed and or downloaded. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Suckatash Show. Like us on Facebook. Email us at T-Y-S-O-N at SuckatashShow.com. Or call into the Suckatash Skype line at our toll call number 818-921-7212. You can also upload clips from your favorite comedy soundcasts directly to us using our direct upload link at Hightail.com slash you slash Suckatash. Suckatash is produced and engineered by Joe Paulino through the auspices of Studio P. Sausalito, the home of the hit. Our hosts are Mark Hershon and Tyson Saner. Our musical director is Scott Carvey. Our booth assistant is Kenny Durgis. Suckatash is executive produced by Mark Hershon. Until next time, I'm your loyal booth announcer, Bill Haywatt, reminding you to please pass the Suckatash goodbye. This has been a Succotash Patch production.